So we've looked at the causes of the American Revolution, or what started it, and we've looked at the fighting. What about the changes? By its very definition, a revolution is a violent upheaval of the status quo. A revolution is meant to bring changes. So how much change did the revolution bring? And in order to answer this question, we will look at three things. The Declaration of Independence, the new state governments that were established when they went from colonies of England to state governments, and the first constitution of the United States, the Articles of Confederation. Revolutions can take many forms. In general, they, uh, there are three levels. Uh, the least amount of change is just changing the head of state. So, uh, like the glorious revolution in England, they just changed one king, uh, got rid of a Catholic king for a Protestant king, uh, but everything else stayed the same. Obviously, that is not a whole lot of change. Then there is change where you change the form of government, like going from a monarchy to a republic. And then there is the most drastic level of change. And what a lot of revolutions are is the poor rising up and taking away the wealth of the rich or overthrowing the system. And those are usually bloody. And that is what most revolutions are. That is the French Revolution, Chinese Revolution, Mexican Revolution. That's what revolutions mostly look like. So what was the American Revolution? And we'll start off by looking at the Declaration of Independence. The Declaration of Independence is in every way, shape, and form propaganda. Now, propaganda doesn't mean it's lies. Propaganda means it's only telling truth from one side. So when you hear people talk about politics and only acknowledge their side, they're just, that's propaganda. Um, so it's not that it's lies, it's just truth from one side. Now, the Declaration of Independence was sent to a committee, but no committee has ever written something this good. It was primarily written by Thomas Jefferson, and he plagiarized the living hell out of other authors. Uh, and when I say plagiarize the hell out of other authors, I especially mean this guy right here, John Locke. John Locke, in one of the most important documents in human history, two treaties of government, he established ideas that Jefferson will take uh, sometimes nearly verbatim. Um, and the idea behind these is first, in terms of natural law, if you, well, human beings naturally will come together and they will form governments. And that is absolutely true. Humans will naturally gather together and form some sort of a government. That is why humans were able to overcome much bigger animals. Um, and by government, that means you just have some basic rules that organize society. Social contract, though, that means that in uh, the state of nature has a law of nature to govern it, which obliges everyone. And reason, which is that law, teaches all mankind who will but consult it, that being all equal and independent, no one ought to harm another in his life, health, liberty, or possessions. Uh, we come together and form a contract, and we all agree on that contract to form a society. So what he is calling for here 
is a democratic form of government. And his ideas will be, well, the ideas are absolutely fundamental to the Enlightenment era. His writings will inspire Alexander Hamilton, James Madison, Thomas Jefferson, all the founding fathers read his work, all the Enlightenment thinkers read his work. Benjamin Franklin, uh, who was, again, one of the most influential pieces of work. And so Jefferson, he wasn't even uh, shy about the fact that he plagiarized the hell out of it. My purpose was not to find out new principles or new arguments never before thought of, not merely to say things which had never been said before, but to place before mankind the common sense of the subject, subject in terms so plain and firm as to command their assent. So he does a phenomenal job about taking John uh, Locke's work, which is dense and a lot of words, and he condenses it down and makes it so simple that people all over the world can understand it. And the way he lays it out also, it is, even at the time, it was really hard to say he was wrong. That is what you call a logical argument or a logician's argument, setting up your evidence so people cannot say you are wrong. And in that sense, it is absolutely brilliant. Now, in order to really understand the Declaration of Independence, the most important part is the first part of the second paragraph. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. And from that one part, we get the most important ideas and the framework for what the United States will become, because the implications are profound. First, to secure these rights, governments are instituted to, among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. What he is calling for here is a government that gets its power from the consent of the governed from the population. Now, today that does not sound like a big deal, but back then it is a really big deal. Remember, this is a period where the world is full of monarchies. Monarchies derive their powers from God. The king gets his power from God. And so, while this does not sound like something radical today, it is very radical for the time. He's calling for a democratic or a Republican form of government. Uh, so within democratic system, you have wide variations. Obviously in the beginning of the country, uh, only white men, only white male landowners could vote. Uh, so, that today would not be considered democratic, but for the time, and that is so important to remember, this is a very radical concept that people, uh, citizens, give the government its power. So that's the first thing is a Republican form of government. Second, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now, in John Locke's work, he, uh, says several places, either life, liberty, or possessions, or estates. Uh, life, liberty, or property is what John Locke says the purpose of government is. Why did Jefferson change this? Because property is a zero-sum thing. Uh, if I have a piece of land, you cannot have that piece of land. If you have a dollar, I do not own that dollar at the same time. So property, that's zero sum. Happiness is not. Happiness is individualistic. And everyone can pursue happiness the way they want to without encroaching on other people's happiness. 
And so that is a very individualistic idea. Jefferson was very individ individualistic. He prized individualism. And so before this, uh, governments, it was assumed citizens were meant to do what was good for the empire. Jefferson is calling for a government whose purpose is to help individuals find happiness. That is an insanely radical idea. Um, and it had never been, that concept had never been tried before. And that especially is important to the United States because the United States is such an individualistic nation. Again, it is one of the reasons, big reason the United States has become the world superpower when not taken too far. Individualism is a phenomenal thing. So uh, it's calling for a government that supports individualism. And finally, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by the, their creator with certain unalienable rights. Now this is really a really wild concept. Uh, he is calling for equality. All men are created equal. I'm, did Jefferson believe that? Of course not. He had slaves. Uh, he did not believe women should have rights. So that is the most radical concept to have a society or to just the belief that everyone is equal. I mean, most people today do not believe that. And uh, just look at, just look at the way uh, the United States treats people from other countries. Uh, Hell, the number one thing that will determine whether you will be rich in life is how much money your parents have. That's not always been true in U.S. history, but today, uh, over the last 30 years, it definitely is true. Today, the most important thing that will determine your wealth is not how hard you work, level of education, intelligence. It is how rich are your parents. So... To say that all men are created equal, that is an incredibly radical, radical concept. Uh, and it didn't represent any sort of reality then, and it doesn't represent any sort of reality now. However, what's really important about this is it represents an ideal. It represents an objective, a target that Americans have been striving for ever since. If you want to know the long history of the United States is trying to live up to these ideals, trying to live up to a society uh, where we have a Republican form of government, where we have a government that allows each individual to pursue their own happiness and where everyone has equality of opportunity. It's not equality of ends. That's communism. communism. Quality of opportunity has the opportunity to get ahead in life, to become wealthier than they were born. If you look at the long scope of the United States, that is what U.S. history is, is trying to live up to those ideals. Those are liberal ideals. And when I say liberal, uh, I mean by definition of liberal uh, Synonym is enlightened or free and free. So trying to create a more free society, a more equal society where everyone has a quality of opportunity. That is what the U.S. has been striving for ever since. Obviously, there's a lot of backsliding, but uh, that part of the Declaration of Independence alone makes the Declaration of Independence by far the most radical thing of the entire American Revolution. The single most radical thing produced from the American Revolution is 
the Declaration of Independence and what the Declaration of Independence is calling for, especially when you consider it in terms of the times it was written, then it's even more radical. It is a phenomenal document and it has been copied over and over and over again. I think, uh, I want to say the, the some, somewhere in the neighborhood of uh, like 180 countries have copied the Declaration of Independence. And it's because it's just written so well, he did such a good job about wording it in a way that it did command uh, consent and it will be used Venezuelans. All legitimate government derives the, uh, derives from the consent of the people because naturally men being equal, there is no one right insulting to another in the life, health, liberty, or property. A uh, bunch of women will get together in 1848 in Seneca Falls, led by Elizabeth Cady Stanton, and will say, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men and women are created equal. Uh, even a bunch of socialists in Vietnam, uh, Ho Chi Minh, the leader of the, of the uh, North Vietnamese, he absolutely love George Washington and the American Revolution. All men are created equal. They're endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. Among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So it is such a phenomenal document. It, it has been copied over and over and over again. It was calling for things. When it was written, the country was not democratic by any stretch of the imagination today. Uh, there was not a quality of opportunity especially when you compare it to today, but even today, uh, we still have not lived up to the ideals. And that is why the Declaration of Independence is the most radical part of the whole revolution and why it is so important. What about the state governments? Once the United States declared independence, once the colonies declared independence, they then went from being colonies to being states, and they all had to write their own state constitutions. By 1780, every state will write, will have their own constitutions. So what kind of political, economic, and social reforms did the new state governments have? In terms of political reforms, um, Every state already had a Republican form of government. They had a legislature where people elected representatives and there were no hereditary positions. You had to be elected. So you didn't automatically get to have power um, just because your family member did. And uh, they, in most states, they put the vast majority of power in the legislatures. And the reason they did that is because under the monarchy, when they were colonies, the king always had someone appointed, usually the governor uh, that represented the king that would try to take power from the colonies. And it was the legislatures that defended that power. So in most of the governments, state governments, they made the governor insanely weak and they put all the power in the legislature. Now, because all the power is in the legislature, that means it is closer to the people. So it is closer to individual citizens, which means it is a more democratic system. Now, again, um, we are talking about democracy for the time. So there will be some states that will make uh, become more democratic in the sense that they will drop uh, land requirements or, uh, you know, and just say anyone that's paying taxes can vote. But none of them obviously allow women or anyone that's not white to vote. So uh, it was a more democratic system. Some states went a little bit farther and dropped the property mandates, but 
it will be, uh, there will still be greater democracy. And in the United States, we love the word democracy. For a lot of our history, we have, uh, especially in the 20th century. Love the idea of democracy and more power in the hands of the people. So the state governments will be more democratic. In terms of religion, the revolution set in motion the transition from states just tolerating religions, because virtually all states tolerated other religions, but they still demanded, uh, a lot of states still demanded everyone pay taxes to a certain church. And during the revolution, that will start to change. We will make the transition from just tolerating other religions to true religious freedom and separation between church and state. Again, uh, that is something that is absolutely essential for a functioning government. There is no such thing as a theocracy or rule by one religion that is effective and free long term. Uh, has never existed and it cannot exist. So we will start moving in that direction. There's been a very big push in the last couple decades to say the Founding Fathers uh, wanted state supported religion and they wanted uh, the government they wanted the government to support one religion and you have to completely ignore all the laws in the states especially the most famous one virginia in virginia they will pass the virginia statute for religious freedom which will establish true religious freedom and that was written by thomas jefferson jefferson will be so proud of this that on his tombstone, he only wanted three things. He only has three things. Declaration of Independence, Virginia Statute for Religious Freedom, and the University of Virginia, which he will create. Uh, it was that was intellectual freedom, religious freedom, and personal freedom. Again, he was an absolute individualist, and uh, it is one of his proudest documents. Now, some states like Massachusetts won't have True, true religious freedom to like 1830s, but it set in motion religious freedom and uh, it depended on the state, but all states would be moving in that direction. What about slavery? Obviously, uh, the Declaration of Independence, all men are created equal, uh, doesn't exactly conform to slavery. During this period, the Founding Fathers are the first generation that will have to confront the issue of slavery. And during the war, they will start moving in the direction because even at the time they understood that slavery was not compatible with what they were trying to fight for. It's funny, uh, so much of their protest against what the British were doing uh, especially in the South, they would say the British are trying to enslave us. Even Northerners were like, come on. Obviously, uh, slavery, we'll come back to this, but it is an economic issue, first and foremost. And so there will be some states that will move in the direction to start getting rid of slavery. And it is all the states north of the Mason-Dixon line. The Mason-Dixon line is that line between Maryland and Pennsylvania. They will all move in the direction of either abolishing it outright or putting it on the path to getting rid of it. Uh, it's called gradual emancipation. It's what they, like what they did in New York. Set, uh, said no new slaves are allowed into the state and uh, everyone born, uh, every person born to slaves will be free at the age of 25. So it ends slavery, but over a very, very long period of time. This generation though, they understood that slavery was incompatible with the Declaration of Independence. And so they will call slavery a necessary evil. Make sure you remember that. 
So they did not try to defend it as a positive good. That will come later. They called it a necessary evil. Because why exactly did the states north of the Mason-Nixon line start on the path of getting rid of slavery? Are they just better human beings up there? No, it's because they didn't have the economic need. The places that kept slavery are the places that produce cash crops, especially tobacco and cotton. Those have to be hand-picked. All the places that voluntarily gave up slavery, it was not economically important. And so none of them, uh, none of their populations were more than 10% of them were slaves because they just did not need slavery economically. So they could do it. So some states will get rid of slavery outright. All the states north of, north of Mason-Dixon line will start on the path of getting rid of slavery. Uh, but in the South, slavery will stay. So in terms of slavery, uh, it is like with everything else, it's a mixed bag depending on the state. What about economic reforms? A lot of revolutions, the poor rise up and they take all the money and property from the rich. Uh, what about the American Revolution? Obviously, the American Revolution, it was started by Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, Alexander Hamilton, George Washington, really, really rich people. So there is not going to be any, there, there will not be some massive economic redistribution and ec economic reforms. The only wealthy people that lost all their property were the loyalists, the people that sided with the British and tried to help the British, state governments will pass laws to take their property. Mostly that was used to pay bonuses to the uh, soldiers, uh, the rebels. So there will be some rich people that get their property taken, but it is only the rich people that bet on the wrong side. So it is not, uh, this is not everyone. Just random side note. The absolute most vicious, bloody, and horrible fighting was not between the British and the Americans. It was between the rebels and the loyalists. And that fighting, it got really vicious and ugly. So there is not massive economic reforms. Some people lost everything, but it's because they sided with the enemy. What about women? Before the war, women couldn't vote. They couldn't, um, they weren't allowed to preach in most places. They couldn't hold any political office. Uh, they didn't even own property. They didn't own their children. They had no legal rights at all. There will be women that will fight for more rights, most notably Abigail Adams. Uh, if you want to know the greatest love story in one of the greatest love stories in all of U.S. history, it's John and Abigail Adams. If you ever have a chance, uh, watch the John Adams miniseries on HBO. It's HBO, so like somehow they managed to just pee on a piece of paper and it turns into gold. But the John Adams miniseries is absolutely phenomenal, and their relationship is so great. They would. Uh, they were best friends, and they genuinely loved each other. And the new code of laws, which I suppose it will be necessary for you to make, the code of laws, she's talking about new constitutions. I desire you would remember the ladies and be more generous and favorable to them than your ancestors. Uh, remember, all men would be tyrants if they could. This is Adam's response to his wife that he loves dearly. Depend upon it. We know better than to repeal our masculine systems. Thomas Jefferson, the guy who's obsessed with, you know, liberty and freedom and individual rights. Tender breasts of ladies were not formed for political convulsions. Women will get nothing. Women will get absolutely nothing. Uh, governments start supporting, they start promoting what they call Republican motherhood which means, hey, just have a bunch of babies. We need more people. So, you know, women will get the right to have, do the same thing they had already been doing, which is have a lot of babies. So 
So in terms of the economic, political and social reforms, it is not revolutionary. Uh, it is not a massive change, a massive disruption at the state level. So what about the first constitution of the United States, the Articles of Confederation? The Articles of Confederation were uh, created in 1777 and they will go into effect in 1781. This was an insanely reactionary document. And by reactionary, what I meant is it was not thought through very well and it was created in reaction to the government that the Amer uh, population had just left, which was the monarchy. So because Americans were afraid of putting too much power in the federal government or into the national government, it was an insanely weak, weak central government. Central, national, and federal all mean the same thing. It was insanely weak. In fact, the only reason they did it was because the French wouldn't create an alliance unless there was a government. The French weren't going to create an alliance with every one of the states, so they had to in order to get the alliance. So it was insanely weak. And essentially what it did is maintain the status quo. It kept everything as much the same as it possibly could. Um, in terms of the government, it had a what's called a mono legislature. So, uh, you know, bicameral legislature is two houses. It's a mono legislature. So there's one body and it's not even representative. Every state has one vote. So it is an uh, insanely weak, weak document. According to the articles, gover uh, federal government had a few powers. One, the power to uh, over war and peace. So only the uh, that one mono legislature can declare war and peace. Um, it could arbitrate disputes between states. So it could, if two states were bickering about something like territory, then it could oversee those disputes and um, it had some power, but not very much even in that sense. It had the power to coin money. It had the power uh, over the postal service and um, Indian affairs. And it had the power over the Western territories or the land that, uh, or the land that was not claimed by any of the states. However, it had so many weaknesses. So besides being a mono legislature that wasn't even representative, every state has one vote regardless of the state size. Uh, there is no chief executive, so there's no president. There is no national court system. So that means every state gets to interpret the laws how they want. Uh, and I know in Texas, that is a very popular idea, but it is a, you cannot have a functional government and every state gets to decide which laws they want to uh, follow or not. No power of taxation. And again, it's one of those things that people think sounds like a good idea, but you cannot have a government that doesn't have the power to tax. So the government can declare war, it will not have the power to raise money for that war. So it is, and we'll see in the next lecture, if the government cannot raise money to, for the war, it cannot fight a war because it cannot, it can't pay the soldiers. So that was a disaster throughout the uh, entire American Revolution. It was just, just funding. All the funding had to come from loans from other countries. Um, no power to regulate interstate foreign commerce. That was also a disaster. So every state would have to work out trade deals with England. And as we'll see later, uh, England will take full advantage of that and punish certain, punish certain states uh, that 
it was particularly angry at, like Massachusetts. Uh, and most importantly, any amendment to the articles required unanimous approval from the states. So all 13 of the states had to agree to a change. And obviously that just was not going to happen. Uh, so the federal government essentially had no power. Now, this did represent the most pragmatic solution in a time of war. So it is easy to criticize the Articles of Confederation and it will prove to be a very ineffective government. But it was passed in order to get an alliance with France during the war and there was not time to work out all the kinks. Uh, so this is the most practical form of government that could be created, but it essentially created no government. So two really important things to understand about the Articles of Confederation. First, there is no central governing body. There is no federal government. It basically kept all the power in, it kept all the power in the states, uh, like it had been uh, essentially before. Now there is no king, though. So there is no central government. And there are a lot of people I have had in graduate classes. I had a lot of classmates that would say like, oh, no, the articles were a great government. Uh, the reason they said that was because they were libertarians. And so what most people do is they start with their solution, whether it's libertarian, socialist, Democrat, Republican, and then they work backwards and try to fit history to conform into their views. Uh, the Articles of Confederation are a disaster. And the thing is, there is a term for this kind of government. It's called a uh, confederation or a confederacy. And this will prove to be very ineffective and Every other one that we've had in the world has also proved to be ineffective. The government under the uh, Confederate States of America, that will be a confederacy like this, and it will be a, an absolute disaster. The European Union, there is no central governing body, and it is an insanely weak. It basically unites Europe by a currency. So. I'm not just picking on libertarians. I say the same thing to libertarians as I say to socialists. Show me one example in history of a government like this working. I am absolutely willing to change my mind or change my opinions, change my views. I just need one example. There's never been an example of a socialist government that works long term. They'll have a couple decades where their economy goes up and then like we're seeing in China, crashes really quick. And there's no example of a confederation that is effective does not exist it is an idea that has no that has never been successfully accomplished so the articles of confederation as we will get to next lecture they will be a disaster the other thing to understand is this like in the state governments, this creates a country with greater democracy. Since there's no power in the federal, federal government, that means all the power is in the state governments. And in the state governments, there was very little power in the governors and almost all the power in the state legislatures. State legislatures, that, is the, that means it is closest to the people. That means this is about as democratic as a government as you can get. And Keep that in mind. In the United States, we love the word democracy. We love the concept of democracy. Uh, just so you know, the founding fathers, when they used the term democracy, they used it as a pejorative. They would call each other, if they said, you're acting like a, uh, uh, you're acting like a Democrat. Uh, they are criticizing each other. Because dictators use the rhetoric of democracy. 
dictators are the ones that would say like, oh, you people are, you're all perfect and I'm going to give you everything you want. And that's how they would get people to support them. So what they would call each other uh, Democrats. And they're basically saying, you're acting like a dictator. You're acting like a, a wannabe dictator. You're acting like uh, someone that's an authoritarian. It's not until Andrew Jackson that the word democracy starts becoming a good thing. And we will get to that later. So overall, the American Revolution had some changes. Uh, it was a political change. The United States went from being a monarch, well, it was a colony of a monarchy, to a republic. However, that is about the extent of the change. In terms of the economic, political, and social changes, those only happened at the state level, and at the state level, it varied. Uh, it varied between the states, but there was not a lot of change even at the state level. The federal level, the national level, there was virtually no change, and at the state level, there was very little change, and it depended on which state you were talking about. And this should make sense, though, because the American Revolution, it is a conservative revolution. And it sounds like an oxymoron, but it is a conservative revolution in that the British are the ones that changed the system. 1763, the British, and you can argue whether they were right or wrong. You can argue whether they were justified to make the changes, but it, it is the British that changed the system. What the colonists wanted and what they made it very clear they wanted, the First and Second Continental Congress, to go back to the way things were in 1763. That is their objective. That is what they are trying for. And also, so they're not, the revolution wasn't fought for changes. The revolution was fought to go back to the way things were. Uh, so it's a backwards looking revolution and it's led by the richest people in the country, the most elite people in the country. That is very unusual for a revolution. That is insanely unusual. So the United States had a conservative revolution, and so there will not be a lot of changes that take place. The most radical part of the entire revolution is the Declaration of Independence, and it's radical because of the ideas it puts forth, not because it actually creates changes. It creates ideas that the United States will strive for throughout its history. But ultimately, it is a conservative revolution and the United States fundamentally is a very conservative country. The United States is a very, very slow country to change. It takes a long time before it will deal with very serious issues. Uh, I always quote Winston Churchill, Americans will always do what's right once they've exhausted every other option. The United States has always been very slow at making changes. And that is appropriate because it started with conservative revolution and it is fundamentally a conservative country. Uh, we will go through, we go through periods of reform every 80 years, 80 years or so. So the United States it will gain independence, but it is the lone republic in a world full of monarchies, and it is the first republic the world had seen since the Greeks. And so it is incredibly weak, and it is very insecure. And we will get to next lecture what the U.S. was like under the first constitution the Articles of Confederation, and why, ultimately, the people we call the Founding Fathers will create the Constitution that creates a much stronger national government.